Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at texasconflictcoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. For some of us, the experience of being in conflict is daunting. We have learned through our families of origin, friends, teachers, and other sources how to manage our interpersonal disputes, including trial and error, which are often our main teachers. And in this episode, the quest for conflict mastery, the quest for engaging more effectively in conflict commonly begins when we realize our usual approaches are no longer working. Or we're faced with situations that overwhelm us or get us into trouble. So in this program, Cindy Noble will discuss her view of the meaning of conflict mastery, also referred to as conflict intelligence, and what helps optimize the quest to get there. So who is Cindy? And her name is spelled C-I-N-N-I-E. Cindy Noble is a lawyer, mediator, meaning also an advanced practitioner through the Association of Conflict Resolution, a professional certified coach based in Toronto, Canada. She developed this synergy model of conflict management coaching in 1999 and coaches people worldwide in their efforts to improve the way they engage in their interpersonal conflicts. Cindy and her associates also train coaches, mediators, lawyers, HR professionals, psychologists, social workers, leaders, and many others around the world to use her unique evidence-based coaching model. She is the author of five books, the most recent being Conflict Management Coaching, The Synergy Model, and that's spelled C-I-N-E-R-G-Y. And her most uh, upcoming book that she's writing on is entitled Conflict Mastery Quest, Sean. That's Quest and then I-O-N-S in parentheses, very unique title. And that will be released this year, and that's what we'll be talking about. We are taking live callers' questions and comments, so I see that we have some folks in the studio. You're going to press the one key if you have comments or questions. Uh, if you are listening by computer, you want to call in, call 347-324-3591. We also have the chat room open, have some guests there. Uh, feel free to leave your uh, comments and questions in the chat room. We'll bring that into the show. And finally, we are running our live Twitter feed tonight, and we're using the hashtag TCC Radio. So a lot of engagement hopefully going on for tonight. Cindy, welcome back to the program. Oh, thank you so much, Patty. It's great to be on again. You know, I feel incredibly humbled, uh, honored, and blessed to have known you. It's been about, I think, 11 years now, um, and I've mm -hmm. learned so much from you, and I, I just feel so blessed about what I've learned, not only about myself and the mastery of conflict, but how I can be a better coach, a better mediator, a better practitioner. So I am so honored, you know, to to have gotten to know you over these years uh, as a colleague and a well, friend. Well, I am so thank too. You. That's very kind. Thank you, Patty. And I have continue to learn from working with you as well. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be on your show. I think you're doing such an incredible job and a service to so many people to have this forum for us to communicate. Well, absolutely, and that's what this is for, is to, to educate, you know, our general public about what this is about. And so let's talk about this quest for conflict mastery. This is not just about practitioners becoming masters. It's about you, listener, everybody outside who are neighbors and friends and people in the grocery store. How do we master our own conflict? So first I want to just start off, Cindy, by asking, what motivates your passion for doing this work and helping people in conflict? Uh, you know, it's such a great question, Patty. I think it's the $64,000 one. I, I'm, I can't say that I know exactly what motivates this, but I can tell you that 
when I was a family lawyer uh, many years ago, that I was struck by the fact that people were suffering so much from from not being able to communicate and connect with and manage conflict with their partners, and that it was leading to the breakdown of marriages. And I found it so sad. And I and there was something about uh, what is it about learning how to manage conflict and how as we grow into adults that we, things stop working that we thought worked or even if they didn't work before that we hope that they're going to. So I became, I think, quite um, quite intrigued by the whole notion that maybe we can do conflict better, that though we learn by trial and error, that we are at choice about about conflict because we don't have a rule book and it's how we learn to assimilate and communicate and interact and it just piqued my interest so much and I went on to take a master's of law in alternate dispute resolution and when I moved to the workplace I saw the same kinds of dynamics in families where so many people were miserable and suffering and in emotional pain about the breakdown in relationships and that it had so much to do with the inability, the lack of competence to manage conflict. And I think I just it just opened up the door for me to look at what my purpose was in terms of helping people find their way through conflict. Wow. Well, so it really did start a long time ago. And, you know, with the, we're going to talk about conflict mastery in particular, but, you know, for those um, who want to know, you know, you, you spent a lot of time, uh, and I don't even know how many years, but researching, working uh, with individuals to create this very specific, uh, ev- as you said, evidence-based model of conflict coaching. But let's really get into kind of this upcoming book that you have, uh, and that is around conflict mastery. And so what do you mean by that term, conflict mastery or conflict intelligence? Well, I started to use the term some years ago, and I think those are interchangeable, conflict mastery and conflict intelligence. And I think conflict intelligence and mastery is every bit as important as emotional and social and other intelligence we talk about to, that are lead help us lead fulfilling happy meaningful lives to work productively to interact in mutually respectful ways and i think that we generally have not put the energy and time into adding conflict intelligence to those intelligence that will help us do that uh, for instance, in organizations, effective conflict management is not a core competency in, men, in many. And when it is, there are often not support systems that are there to help people gain conflict intelligence. And so people are often at their wit's end and uh, go again by trial and error to figure out the many, many situations that they have. And so. As you said when in the introduction, um, it can be daunting for many people, and it's not until, until a client of mine um, will say, things aren't working anymore, and my relationship, relationships are breaking down, or I'm not, I'm not managing things well because when it comes to dealing with people, I don't know how to do X, Y, and Z, and it all often has to do about communications and about, about managing the conflicts that will ensue because of messages that hurt and offend, and it, appear, it occurred to me that there was this intelligence that we're often missing. And so to answer your question more specifically, I think that for me it means having the knowledge and skills to understand and analyze conflict dynamics, uh, contemplating not only what's going on for ourselves when we find we're reacting to stimuli that provoke us, but we pay attention to what, what's going on for the other person and how, we, how may we be contributing to the discord in ways that adversely impact her or him and the relationship. I think of confident intelligence, too, is acknowledging that we have choices about how to interact and that we're open to considering and finding different ways of being in conflict. It's about aligning with our values about how to communicate and, and how to uh, work with people, how to, how to respond and receive and deliver messages in constructive ways without demeaning and shaming or humiliating other people. And I think of when we're, when we're conflict intelligent, we accept we do not have to agree on everything. 
uh, and that at a minimum, hearing and paying attention to what our differences are enriches our understanding of what's important to one another. And I, you know, there's so many other things, Patty. A couple of things that I would add is that it's it, common intelligence is about reacting and uh, re-reflecting, not reacting. It's about responding, not reacting. And we do not operate on assumptions and judgment and do not attribute fault and motives. Um, rather, we look deeper and, and, and interact with dignity and respect and humility in, in order to make a situation that might be fractious more of an opportunity to get to know somebody and what's important to them and to be able to convey what's important to us in ways that are aligned with who we want to be and also acknowledge the other person and, and what they're, what's important to them. Hmm. So there's a lot of components and elements to being a, a master of how, a self-mastery, if you will, of how we deal with mm -hmm. conflict, how we understand it, our knowledge of it, um, our ability to ana analyze, and like you said, to be able to make choices about how we uh, respond, reflect, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, as you know, and most people out there know, the, the typical response about conflict is that we hate conflict, we avoid it at all costs, uh, you know, although there are those who, who really do engage in conflict quite well and they think they're trying to be collaborative by saying, let's just put it out on the table, let's just talk about it, even though the other person. When is conflict necessary or unnecessary, if there is such a yes, thing? I know. Well, you know, I started to use those terms because I was, I was looking at the concepts of, of positive conflict and that when, when might we, how might we look at conflict in a way that accepts our differences and our humanness and other things that, that are, to me, aspects of making conflict a positive experience for ourselves and for the other person. And it occurred to me as I'm talking about that, that there's some conflicts that, to me, are more necessary than others. And so a necessary conflict would refer to um, the fact that differences often need to be surfaced before it's even possible to achieve the idea of positive conflict, that before we're able to look at what is going on with you and what's going on with me, and necessary in relationships that matter. In workplaces, people might say, well, they don't matter as much as my family, and yet we're interdependent in the workplace. And so if we don't surface what's important to us, then there is more likelihood not only of conflict erupting in very negative ways along the way, but I think it impacts our health and our well-being and our resilience and our productivity in ways that are not really measured. We do talk about it, those of us in the, in the field of alternate dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution, but I don't think we often look at if we don't get to the crux of what's happening and surface it and see if there's a way to at least have a meeting of the minds, even if you're accepting that there are differences, that it will come out in another way. And so I think it's the art of delivering and receiving difficult messages without judgment and with thoughtfulness and compassion and, and with an idea of moving forward and, uh, and identifying what, it, what needs to be said and how, how is it going to be said. And this is in comparison to unnecessary conflict. And in that, I think it's when, when people who are in dispute engage in impulsive, more destructive interactions that could escalate so easily to blaming and shaming. And what I have found out in my coaching practice that those ongoing, lingering conflicts that uh, have, have been raised in ways that are not productive end up firmly packed in the baggage that we carry from dispute to dispute. And I think as compared to necessary conflict, unnecessary conflict lacks positive intent and humility and dignity uh, and, and choice, uh, the ability that we all have to choose ways of being and interacting that make conflict a much more positive experience and an opportunity to, uh, to get along, to uh, to interact in ways that are more compatible with how we want to be in the world and be with people. 
Very good. Oh, I'm so glad that you made uh, some of those distinctions um, because the thing about it is, is I don't want people to think that, okay, I'm in a conflict, I'm stuck in a conflict, and there's no way out or that it's only destructive, which only reinforces the fact that they hate conflict. So it's, it's really there are skills, there are supports, and, you know, to learn these things and to practice these things and build that confidence, you know, and that competence and that mastery and intelligence. So one of the ways that you have people do that, especially around the reflection piece, um, is you're currently writing another book called The Conflict Mastery Quest Shans, which I love. And it's based on your previous blog writings, your ongoing blog on the conflict mastery questions. So what is your fascination with the use of questions and the power, really, that comes from using them in your coaching sessions with clients? Well, I I think, uh, Patty, you and and those people who know my coaching model and know me uh, realize that I'm quite fascinated with questions and have been intrigued by them for many, many years. It's a core competency of certified coaches. I found that when I was developing my model of conflict management coaching that using questions as most coaching models would do uh, helps people look at their situations in different ways. And that's, that's one of the reasons people seek coaching is to gain different perspectives and to optimize their potential. And as I was researching, I started to find the kinds of questions that would move people from where they were to where they wanted to be. And sometimes I find the insights people have from the well-framed question, I find it's phenomenal the reactions that people have to finding out something they didn't know by looking inside. I think of the kinds of questions I like to use are self-reflective in that people, if people say, well, that's a hard question, then I know I've got, I've got a really good question. And so it's helping people look differently and gain insights. And what happens in coaching that you would know yourself is from week to week that a question can plant a seed and then it germinates within the week and someone comes a call saying, that question, you know, I've thought about this. And I just I find it so fascinating, and so it led me to want to develop my own skill and to help my clients who are so awesome around uh, sharing what works for them and what doesn't work. And I'm still learning, and I will be an ongoing learner about questions. And I think that the fascination has grown incredibly uh, in recent years when I started to do the blog because. I became more in touch with idioms and metaphors and expressions that we use a lot in conflict that were just prime for asking a question that landed on somebody in a way that opened up their thinking. Um, And I was just going to add something, too, that uh, in the foreword of my book, I I, um, am reprinting a wonderful poem by David White called Sometimes, and in it he refers to questions that have no right to go away. And I loved that. And I thought so much mm. about how people who, who a question lands on them, they'll remember that question and they'll start applying it to something else that they can use it. And, and how deep and rich that is to be able to give a gift to somebody in, in a way that who would have thought it. That is really, oh, I love that. I have to read that poem. Uh, I actually have to get your book. Um, so, so. Before we go on, I just want to let listeners know that you are tuned in to the blog talk radio show, Texas Conflict Coach, and we're talking with Cindy Noble, the founder, creator, and guru of the Synergy Conflict Management Coaching Model that's used worldwide. And, you know, going to your blog, your late, just to give listeners an example of some of the things that you do, your latest blog uh, just posted uh, either today or yesterday was Get Your Goat. Uh, and and that's, a, that's an example of one of the idioms uh, that you were referring to. And, and I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to share just a couple of the questions as an example of what you've been talking about. Um, sure. 
Yeah, so it, you know, so a couple of the reflecting questions like that, that stand out for me right quick is, you know, what does someone say or do that gets your goat? Or what are three other words describe the impact other than get your goat? Or the visual one is, what about the picture of a goat in your mind's eye does not resonate? I mean, so there's a lot of really great questions uh, that you hear, have here. How do the questions here shift things that they do about the person or situation you have in mind for this exercise? So there's a number of these questions that you have in each of these uh, blog posts uh, and the idiom that we just described today was getting your goat. So I love that you're using those uh, types of idioms. And, and, and why idioms in particular? You know, I think one, one of the important things around questions is uh, that if, if it helps people move from the reactive parts of their brain, like their amygdala to their prefrontal cortex, I know you've had people who've talked about neuroscience on, on your show before, Patty. Um, what I realize is if I'm going to look at the brain from what I've read and heard is that once we are emotionally fired up about a situation like something that provokes us, it's hard to think clearly and to be creative and problem solve. We're kind of caught up in the emotion of things. And so questions help people um, move to the reflective part of their brain. And what I find with idioms and metaphors and expressions that ask people to look at things and that might be bizarre, like you talked about the visual of the goat, I think one of the questions I ask, if I'm not mistaken, is about, um, you know, what, what other animal could, you know, would, would there be that would describe, you know, what, what, what the emotion is. What I think about that or any of the questions you've named and the ones I try to use is that to move to the reflective piece, it's how can you think differently about something? And what, what perspective do, does it give you? And so as a coach, or if, if, you're, if you're not a coach and you're just trying to figure out how to manage conflict differently, if you use some of those expressions, it'll help shift the thinking and the feeling to distance yourself from what's, what, what the uh, crux of a situation is or what the emotion is in order to maybe smile about it or at least uh, psychologically distance from the intensity that comes from other words that might be used to describe what's going on for somebody. So I think, I think that's what drew me to that. And metaphors are so fascinating anyway in that in just their, how they apply um, words and expressions that we're, we're all quite used to in our own way but haven't looked at. And when I describe the origin and look at the origin of some of them, they're quite fascinating. And I think it just helps people, again, distance themselves from the fray. And that works to move to that more thinking piece and how can people start to gain a perspective that they didn't have initially. Great. So let's talk more about the book then, because um, it will be coming out. And so what value uh, can people get from using it as a resource? Who's your target readers, for example? And it, maybe you can give us an example uh, or two uh, about what might be covered in there that would be a help to them. Well, you know, like yourself, Patty, I, I strongly believe in in working in this field for a long time, as, as you have as well, that part of giving practitioners more tools, different tools, is a is a, a way of giving back to our profession. And so I think of the questions as tools for coaches and mediators and for other practitioners, HR professionals and lawyers and people who are working with people in conflict in any capacity to help them find their way through it in, in different ways. It's also, as you have found, about reaching the public that lots is written. There's so many wonderful books on managing conflict that are out there that will appeal to different people. And I think this is one more resource for the general public to look at. And I think that people will identify something in there that would be their language or it may be a metaphor that they use or um, for instance the the book is divided Patty into before during and after conflict and there are 25 topics under each of them 
And so the before ones, for instance, would have the kinds of language and topics that come up before a conflict is actually evolved. And uh, so one of those examples would be before making assumptions. It's a very common thing that starts to happen once we're provoked by somebody, by something they say or do or something they don't say or do. And so as with each of the topics, I have about 150 words or so average that would describe any inclination to do that. And so lots of people will do that, and they'll look at the table of contents and go, okay, well, that's maybe what I'm doing here. And then they would look at what happens with assumptions and you know, why do we go there. And, and it describes then after each of the topic that describes with 100 and 150 words about that topic, there will be 12 questions. Every, the last two questions of each of the topics will always say what else occurs to you as you consider these questions mm -hmm. and what insights do you have. So wanting to grasp any learning. But the 10 questions before that are going to vary from topic to topic. And so under making assumptions, for instance, one of the questions might be, um, uh, you know, what, if, after asking what, what assumptions are you making or how are you interpreting that person's behavior, there'll be another question that might say, what explanation may she or he provide about those actions or words uh, that may not be consistent with what you're thinking? Uh, or somebody else observed the two of you, what else might occur to them? Or if you have done something of that nature, what reasons do you do that? And so those kinds of questions are meant to help people take look at it sort of macro and micro, you know, stand back from it and then look closely at it. And that would be an example of, of before. Uh, a during a question might be uh, criticizing. So often that would be one of, of the 25 topics that might happen during. And I, I should say that a lot of these will overlap. You might not criticize until after, or you might criticize before. So wherever the topic title comes up, you just change the tense, because I'm using them according to before, during, and after. But criticizing might be um, often during. And so it also looks at asking people, what is it particularly, and what bothers you most? It might ask a question, though, like, what do you need or want the other person to say or do instead? that would not, you would not have criticized. And I really like this question. If you were to frame the criticism as a request instead, what would the request be? Mm. So, and then there's after, uh, would similarly ask, uh, go into other kinds of questions and, and uh, around what would happen after. So I know that, that we're running out of time, so I didn't, wasn't going to go into giving you another question at this point. But that's, you know, that's a great, those are, uh, first it helps to understand uh, who can benefit from reading uh, the book and using it actually as a resource uh, and to understand that you've given a number of examples and topics in each of those three sections before, during, and after um, and, and some extremely powerful questions. And so is there one, um, you know, as we begin to wrap up on the show, is there one particular assignment, you know, as coaches we always give field work or, or clients will, you know, mm -hmm. uh, are self-motivated. So is there an assignment for the week or a call to action, one thing that you would want them to practice or use to begin building their own conflict intelligence, taking that first step? Well, I would take a self-reflective approach as I sort of want to do, and I might, you know, when, when we are provoked by something that people do, it, we, we feel that usually experience that a value of ours or a need or an aspect of our identity is undermined. And so I, I would suggest to people to be self-reflective, and when you get defensive about something that someone says or does, to look at what you're defending and to understand whether or not that's really coming from the other person or from your your own needs that are inside and and I think I think identifying what we need and being able to verbalize it is is the step that it takes to start to build some confidence intelligence 
So I love that. What are you defending? And then really identifying what those needs are and how, and how do we begin to make choices around, as you said, respond or, or, or give the message uh, and or receive the message. So where can folks find more about you and your work? And it's worldwide, so even though you're in Toronto, what's the best way for them to find you and reach out to you? Well, the uh, website is Synergy Coaching, C-I-N-E-R-G-Y Coaching.com. And if you look under books, there will be the, the current book, uh, the most recent book that I've done, and then there will be, if you're interested in this one, to send an uh, info at SynergyCoaching.com, and we'll let you know when, when that book is ready. Good. And, and then also on your coaching uh, website, um, there are also all the upcoming trainings that you do around the world, um, around conflict coaching. But there's a number of uh, things that you're training on uh, that are targeted to HR professionals and leaders. Uh, and so that's another opportunity for people to also um, tap into uh, those trainings that you're doing. Uh, and also, I, I believe all your social media is located on your website as well. It's true. It's a Twitter is Synergy Coaching, um, capital Synergy, C-I-N-E-R-G-Y Coaching. The coaching has a capital C. And then Conflict Coaching Guild on LinkedIn has a huge following of well over 3,000 people and wonderful discussion group on conflict matters. So people are absolutely welcome to join that group. So that's the Conflict Coaching Guild, G-U-I-L-D, on LinkedIn. And so if anyone can join that group and participate and learn, because there, there really are a lot of very rich um, uh, insight awareness and, and sharing of knowledge and resources. So, Cindy, I again, I'm so grateful uh, that you have returned to the program to do this, and I'm so excited and happy for you on this uh, next book version that you have on. I'll certainly be using it as a resource, and I refer it, your uh, conflict mastery questions uh, to a lot of people uh, because it's extremely valuable. And so I guess my question as we close is, what is your final message that you want to leave with listeners? I guess the final message is, is that we're, we're at choice, and we do have a choice to respond differently than we are. And if conflict is causing anybody um, misery and suffering, that, that, there, that there are ways to shift it and people there to support you to do that. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in the chat room, the studio, and is also in our Twitter feed. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.